Um, for everyone that's joining us, thank you for coming to our very uh, first um, base camp session that we're running for this year, which is really exciting. So I just had a quick look through some of the names and um, I recognize a few of you. So I know a few of you will know me from work that we've done together. So I'm Alexia. So just to introduce myself to those who haven't met me met me before and I'm the associate consultant here at Red Wolf Group and then I've also got on the call with me who will be helping host this webinar, um, Shannon, who's our people and purpose consultant. Um, so she might be a new face to some of you. She's just joined our team in the last couple of months, which is really exciting. So for those of you who haven't heard of the concept base camp or haven't um, previously attended Alicia's webinars that she's hosted in previous years, the concept of base camp sort of um, came from the idea of coming back to base. So this is an exclusive webinar for all of you who have been PI trained. So you've gone through some type of training program and it's just a great way for us to regroup back together and sort of look at a real um, life situation or scenario that we can talk through and see how we can incorporate PI into that, um, which is very exciting. And hopefully um, this webinar will be interactive for you. So we've got some videos um, scheduled to play and we'll be asking lots of questions. So feel free if you want to unmute yourself to answer or you can use the chat feature. I'm more than happy for you guys to type in your answers and Shannon and I will be monitoring the chat feature and um, trying to really challenge you a little bit when it comes to your PI knowledge um, and seeing how we can make use of it best at work. So this is a four part um, webinar series. So we'll run over the next month of June and each week we'll be focusing on a specific topic. So today we'll be talking about how we can drive change using PI. So change constantly comes up in the business. I'm sure as you're all aware, there's definitely situations where we have to lead change initiatives, um, but it's really important that we get uh, our whole team on board or your employee base on board to make sure that they can help drive that change with you. So to start off with, I'm just gonna play a quick video that sort of sets the tone for this um, topic and just gives us a bit of an example of a scenario that we'll be talking through um, today during the webinar. This is Jack. Jack has been recruited to take on the GM role in a medium-sized financial advisory firm. Jack has noticed a lack of productivity in his team and everyone is working in silos. The board and CEO have advised him that a new strategic plan is about to be rolled out. In the plan, it will require divisions to work more collaboratively in alignment with the customer journey, and this will mean more crossover of work and projects will occur. The business has conducted research into productivity tools and have recommended they implement Trello to help streamline, track, and give visibility to team members about high-priority project tasks and who is responsible for what and when. Jack has been given three months to implement the system effectively, but also increase productivity and start reporting on business results and progress. Jack immediately sets a meeting to advise his team of the new direction and the implementation plans for Trello. The majority of the team appears open to this, however, Jack gets some resistance from Susan. Susan is a longer serving member of the team and is considered the glue of the team. She's the office manager, team administrator, but also the finance person. She keeps track of billings, but also everyone's availability and helps book meetings. She's organized and very particular about how everything should be done, and there's no room for error. Her worries are that someone will put information in wrong and that she won't be able to control this through her manual processes. Susan is very adamant about how things should be done the correct way and gets quite distressed when Jack discusses the idea of implementing the new system. She becomes very agitated every time they mention Trello and how it's going to be used. She constantly complains about how difficult she finds it to use and she's very vocal. Jack recognises that if he can get Susan on board with the change, as she's the self-proclaimed office manager and team coordinator, he believes the other staff will be more willing to use the system and see the benefits. Susan doesn't believe that she needs to change and use what she explains as a very expensive tool to do her job. In her mind, everyone else can use it, but my way works for me. Perfect. So I hope you all got to hear that and sort of get that brief two-minute overview of this scenario. So obviously we've got Jack, who's a new manager trying to implement Trello within his team, and he's got Susan, who's a little bit hesitant to that change and has been quite vocal in saying that. She doesn't believe that she thinks she needs to use it or that she'd like to use it. And so we've sort of landed on this question, how will I get Susan on board? So how can Jack, or if you were in a similar situation and trying to um, plan out a new change initiative, how can you get your team member um, to join and be on board? 
And this is where we'll really be linking in PI and seeing how can we utilize a person's PI profile to sort of identify if you will get resistance prior to talking about change or why you might get that resistance in a profile. So big question there that um, I've left you all with and that we'll keep discussing um, throughout this webinar. So first off, I thought it might be good just to throw out there and see if I can get some responses in the chat or if anyone wants to unmute themselves. What type of profile do they think Jack might be? Um, if anyone's got any ideas or maybe a reference profile or maybe one of the four factors, you might think that, you know, Jack has a low patience drive. Any sort of idea on the type of person Jack might be? <laughs> Someone's made the comment that all they know is that I'm uh, that Susan. <laughs> Julia, so, you're, Julia, you're hilarious. Julia. <laughs> Julia, what does that make, what, what, what makes you think that? It's actually interesting that you ask that because I'm maverick. So I think I'm like really cool with change. I love change. Give me change all the time. But at the same time, I'm, I'm that Susan. So I'm really hesitant when it's time to implement the new kind of tools like Trello. So, yeah, interesting. Mm. Mm. Okay, so your profile is more of that more that maverick style. Yeah. So you notice some similarities there. That's good. She's on the right track, guys. Can anyone else sort of think what what Jack might be through listening to that? So Rhiannon said Jack could be a captain because of the low patience. Really good, Rhiannon. Awesome. Gold star for you and for Yulia too for kind of helping lead, lead you into that potential um, answer. Well done, Rhiannon. So um, Jack is a captain. So his, um, he has a really st his strongest drivers are, as you can see, the widest part of the profile there. So he's got a really high dominance, which is that A factor. Um, and then the C is really low. So his, the, his patience um, is on that other side of the spectrum. So high dominance, low patience, and then um, he's super comfortable with risk. So he was okay to, you know, implement the change, suggest the change. Um, like Ilya mentioned, really loves to, to innovate and think of new change. Um, but what makes it slightly different to that Maverick profile, and as you can see here, the C and the D, which is the, the known as the hook, which is renowned for the captain's profile. So that's, that's a corporate hook um, that separates the, the, the maverick from the captain. So well done, my uh, Rhiannon and Yulia. Um, all good. So, uh, Alexia, I might ask actually yeah. we'll talk to, the, to the audience first. What makes you think, what makes, um, what, what do you think Suzanne's profile is? So switching it up now, we've got Jack's. Any ideas on what Suzanne's might be or any of maybe where her four factors might sit? Hint, she's going to be a little bit different to Jack. And I think the hint will also be if you were listening really closely to some of the things that um, Susan had was, you know, she was seen as a bit of a perfectionist. She wanted to do her job really well. Um so I think thinking about what those type of um, words, what do you think of when with the four factors, what might drive that? So remembering that this type of workshop with all of you, we're not going to sit and talk to you for half an hour. Um, it's really about testing your PI knowledge, engaging with each other, and then, you know, there is no wrong answer here because um, everyone's, you know, really it's testing our knowledge. So it's good to see some comments on the chats as well. So we've got a Three. couple of questions of guardians. Julia, I think you are both on the money again. Susan is a guardian. Great, oh. great guesses and observations. Um, and I'll bring up her profile now and we can see that. Um, so very different to Jack's. If anything, it's sort of, you know, the opposite's the inverse. We've got Jack going sort of right to left and Susan's a bit different. She goes a bit from left to right, that line across. Um, so in terms of typically a guardian profile, they're going to be quite structured and really want all the information and processes in order to make the decision and to do their work to a high standard. 
So I always say that people who have a high formality drive, like Susan, really want to be subject matter experts. So they want to understand their role, what's required of them, and then go about making sure that they do everything to high accuracy and good detail. They also have that higher patience drive. So again, this gives us a little bit of an indication and a hint that they're going to be a little bit more resistant to change. They're going to take a little bit of time to adapt um, due to the fact that they really like those stable, consistent work environments where they've they've got the opportunities to really um, set their own routine and stick to that routine. Naturally, they're going to be a bit more accommodating in nature, so they will be good team players and definitely focus in on the team goals, but have slightly that more reserved personality to them. So they might be a bit um, introspective and like to think things through slightly, um, will be really good in those one-on-one situations, but definitely need that time to think things through and just go away um, and formulate their ideas and opinions. So these are the two profiles we've got. Shannon, yes. Just throw a question out there that's come through. Um, Why not a controller? That's a really good one. Why not a controller? Look, and it seems like um, that, Jatika, you thought that this person might be a controller? Yeah, I mean, it it, it is pretty close to a controller, I felt like, because of the resistance to change and, you know, being factual and trying to do the, you know, right thing. I felt like it could be a controller. Definitely. Yes. No, I see that. And and typically a controller does have that high formality drive as well. So I think you're spot on there. They will be really um, focused on the information and the facts. Um, What's a little bit different to a controller is they've actually got a slightly lower patience drive typically. So they might be a little bit more open to change or handling multiple priorities at once. Um, And that A dominance drive will probably go a bit more into the independent side when we're looking at a controller, but really good observation as well. Suzanne definitely could have been, um, but she might have been slightly more open to that change factor if she was a controller due to her patience drive sitting lower normally when it comes to a controller. But thanks for sharing that. That's really, really good just to talk it through. And that's the thing. There's definitely, there's 17 different reference profiles. So, you know, there's definitely aspects of profiles that will be similar and other aspects that will be different. So really good observation there. Now, in terms of Jack and Suzanne, we've sort of talked through their profiles, but is there any key observations for ever, anyone else who would like to either yeah, unmute or pop in the chat in terms of what will be the key differences between Jack now as a new manager working with Suzanne? What's going to appear from both their profiles that they might struggle with in the beginning or if they don't have that awareness piece of each other? Bit of a tough question, I know. You know you've asked a good question when there's a pause before answers come through. Yes. Definitely. When typing, though, so it might be a bit too question. Here we go. (laughs) Yulia said uh, he should be more patient. Patient with her. Definitely. That's a very big key difference there. Yulia, Jack is going to be very fast paced. He's going to be wanting to move quickly, like we said, handling multiple priorities, but at a fast pace. So he's going to be moving quickly versus Suzanne, who has that higher patience drive, is going to be a little bit more slow, steady, stick with her routine. We'll definitely get the work done accurately, but just at a different pace and probably likes to focus a bit more on each task at hand rather than a million things at once and just going for it all. So I definitely do think that that's a really um, key difference that Jack has to be sort of uh, aware of. Yes, Rhiannon, you've sort of gone ahead and answered my next question in terms of how now Jack is the manager, if you were managing Suzanne, how could you get her on board with this change initiative? So if we looked at her PI profile, let's just say even before we mentioned anything, how can we start to formulate some ideas about getting her on board? And Ree, you've hit the nail on the head. Definitely need to get her buy-in in the project and she needs that detail. So it will be really important as a manager that with Suzanne, if you have someone who's a guardian who has that high or any any reference profile that has that higher patience drive, 
you really need to get their buy-in. And that might mean that you need to have a, maybe a one-on-one conversation with them, let them know about the change that's upcoming. So give them as much notice as possible. Jack's sort of going in and saying, hey, we're using this new system Trello and we're using it tomorrow. That's a little bit unexpected for Suzanne. She's probably been a little bit shocked um, and a little bit hesitant in terms of what is this and why. So it's really important that the detail is provided to her, um, a good explanation why they need to start using it in order to slowly get her buying. And Alicia's put in a really good question here. What's Suzanne's widest factor combination? So we've got some people answering in the chat. D over A, and can anyone remember what D over A is? Risk it first. Thanks, Sri. Yes, Yulia, Eamon, thank you for answering. Um, she is going to be cautious with risk. So we can see right here, if we look at her profile, straight away, D over A, that means that she's going to want to protect the business. She's got that lower A drive, so she's going to be, like we said, accommodating team player. She's even going to want to protect the team and make sure, is this system right for everyone? Might not be, she sees it that it's not right for her, but she might also view that it's not right for everybody and she'll be really hesitant and making sure that the, it's the right decision by Jack and by the MD who sort of put it forward. So when we have that risk profile, that D over A sort of links back up to what Ree mentioned before. Really important that we get their buy-in, that we talk to them beforehand, that we actually explain why the change is happening. Because if Susan has that understanding she might then be able to get that clarity and that information piece and slowly start to implement it. Now, if you were Jack, what else do you think is really important for Suzanne? So, okay, yes, she needs to understand the why, she needs to get the detail, but if she's using a system that she's never used before, we know she's got a high formality drive, so she wants to be a subject matter expert, what else might be really important that Jack offers her? see if anyone's got any ideas if they want to pop it in the chat yep I really like that Yuri thanks for popping that in support buddy up with her while training we've got Danielle and Ree who have both said training absolutely so it would be really great to implement or to help um, initiate some type of training program that might be for Suzanne but it could also be for the wider team but especially for Suzanne for Suzanne, who wants to be that subject matter expert, offering her training, making sure she has full understanding of the system, and then she can go about um, starting to implement it. Eamon's popped that into understanding and support. So that could be, yes, a buddy up. There might be someone else on the team who's used this process before, feels really comfortable with it, and can buddy up with Suzanne and help her along. It might be um, some online training modules. Um, it might be some one-on-one -on -one sessions getting through um, how to use the software, but all of that is really crucial and important. If Suzanne has that training piece, she has all the information, the details, she understands the why, she'll then go about wanting to implement that change and sort of get that, I would say, a little bit that eye-opening moment where she realizes why she has to use it and how it can improve her routine. Really, she's going to also be about efficiency. That's also really important. So if we can prove to her through training and through that support that um, this process will help make her daily routine at work more efficient, that will also help get that buy-in from her. Alicia's just popped in another question um, in the chat. What is Jack's widest factor combination? Correct. Yes. He is A over C. Yes, Yuri, I like what you've written in it. Yes, get it done. <laughs> Very proactive. So the fact that someone's come up and told him, hey, you've got three months to implement this new program. We want to see you know, X, Y, and Z in terms of results. Jack said, yes, let's do it. Let's get it done. He's linked it with his objectives. Obviously, he's a proactive um, type of person. And so he wants to hit the ground running straight away. And we can also see coupled with that low patience drive, happy to 
conform to change, happy to sort of switch things up and really ready to go with that. Versus if we look at Suzanne, is she proactive as well or does she have a different factor combination when it comes to that? That AC drive. Correct. Yes. Thank you, Tatika. You're quite the opposite. Yes. So she is actually C over A. So she is responsive. So again, that's another key difference that we can see between the two profiles. Of course, Jack's going to just run with it. A over C is proactive, wants to get going. But Suzanne, C over A, she's a bit more responsive. Again, she needs to get that time to really think about the detail. Why does she need to do it? Understand the process and then go about. I like that. Someone's putting actually can be a good counterbalance to Jack not listening. Yes. And yes, Yuri, I would say that Suzanne is definitely more process driven, 100% versus Jack, who is a bit more outcome driven. And Dolly, you've just sort of hit something there that I wanted to ask next. How could Jack and Suzanne actually complement each other to do with their profiles? Is there anything that anyone observes here that they could actually complement each other? And thinking about that counterbalance. It's a bit of a tricky one. I'll wait and see if anyone pops anything to, into the chat. Does anyone observe any ways that they could actually work really well together? Another tough question, I know. <laughs> really making everyone think. I think Yuri's on the money there with his comment of um, Susan is all about the process and Jack's yes. all about the outcome. So I Correct. think, you know, the comment also that everyone's going to, like they're actually a good counterbalance for each other if you look at it in a really positive way. Um, they're just probably not seeing it that way right now. Um, yeah. And I think, Ria, you've put that in there too. Jack will keep the project to plan, but Suzanne will ensure it's done correctly. Exactly. So one thing that I like to always mention about the patience drive, that C drive, is a person who has a low patience drive can still work really well with someone who has a high patience drive. And I like to look at it um, in these two ways. So your low patience drive person will be a great change initiator. So like you're saying, Ree, we'll definitely keep the project to plan, get everyone on board and start it off. Now, where Suzanne will really come in is to do with the implementation or the process, like what you were saying, Yuri. She will actually be able to see this project out into the long term versus Jack, who's a captain. Give him a few weeks. He's going to be on to the next task, the next thing, the next priority. Suzanne will actually have that ability. If we provide her with the training, she becomes knowledgeable. She becomes that subject matter expert. Jack could actually get Suzanne to lead this in the long term. He could actually get her to take the lead on this project, make sure that the team are using it correctly, make sure that the team are staying accountable to it, whether it's, you know, weekly check-ins, fortnightly, whatnot. But Suzanne will be that great person to actually implement that change due to the fact that she is very process-driven. So really, really good there, everyone. I think that all got us thinking in terms of even though profiles can be different and Jack and Suzanne are very different when it comes to their profiles, there's still ways that we can work well together. It's just having that awareness piece of each other, which I think is really important. So just moving on next, I thought it was it would be really good just to talk about the top tips when it comes to um, change and how we can utilise a person's profile um, to do with that change initiative and making sure we can get them on board. So obviously everyone's going to be different. So some people will have a different profile to Suzanne, but that doesn't matter. There might still be some issues when it comes to their want or need to go about and actually implement that change process. So number one, I would always say is find out the person's strongest driver when you're looking at their profile. So thinking back to Suzanne, her strongest driver was her formality, her D drive. That was really important to her, understanding all the information, the facts, the data to make a decision and to do her work. So whenever you're looking at a profile, if there's any type of change you need to initiate, have a look at their strongest driver and see if that change is going to affect that driver. So again, 
You can address that highest factor when you're having a conversation with them. You can help lead that in um, and really take the bias away when you're speaking to people and just go in with a little bit more knowledge and awareness of the person. Number three, definitely look at their risk profile, like what we talked about, what Alicia mentioned. What's their AD relationship? Are they comfortable with risk or are they cautious with risk, especially when we're looking at a change initiative? That will let us know whether we'll get that buy-in quicker or whether we actually need to make things a little bit more in stages and implement things incrementally. And then finally, just review the factor combinations. Have a look at the top three, four factor combinations of the profile. Compare it to yourself. You might have to slightly adapt your communication style in terms of how you describe this change initiative to a person. Um, you might have to do it maybe in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, definitely review the factor combinations and see how you can um, use that to your advantage when speaking to a person. Any questions there? I just thought I might just make sure there's no questions anyone's got in the chat before we move on from here in terms of the tips. Nothing else has come through. My my other um, piece with the top tips for those of you who are thinking about change and looking at someone's profile is when we do look at their strongest driver to go to the four factors cheat sheet that you all have. And so let's say we look at Susan, what her highest drive was that formality. But if you go to the needs section, right, that drive, we know the drive creates needs and our behaviour is a response to that need. So if we go deeper on the needs, well, what did she need? She needed clarity of expectations and maybe Jack's just gone in and gone, here's what we're going to do, everyone. Like, how exciting is this? And she's like, I don't understand what you mean. I don't understand the why. I'm not an expert in it. We know high formality people, their needs are to be an expert. They love and need training in their job, which was mentioned in the group chat earlier. So, in fact, most of the push from her in terms of pushback was because her needs weren't being met. So if we think about, for us, you've got PI at your fingertips, you can have a look at someone's drivers and that then leads to their needs. So it is, I always talk about whenever we're working with people, we're managing people, you're managing those needs. That's that's the secret source here. Um, and this aim comes off when we look at those factor combinations. Okay, if she's really wide, her widest factor combination was D over A, and Shannon said it earlier, she wants to protect the, the pack from risk. And she perceives this as a risk and a threat to her pack. So again, in looking at those needs, why is she responding that way? Because her needs are in threat. Um, so it's it's really powerful when you start to think of it that way um, and you start to really drill into it. And these will become more relevant to you when you go through a situation and it's really relevant in your world. Um, so, yeah, just that extra extra tip for you is to look at the needs. 100%. Thanks, Leisha. Really, really, really useful. So we thought we'd do something a little bit interesting and we thought we might flip it. Let's flip Suzanne. She's not a guardian anymore. Forget it. Um, she is now a venturer. So very different to a guardian profile. And I've got here venturer profile. So I'll let you all take a look at where the four factors sit to do with a venturer. Um, and I thought it'd be good just to talk through the different experience now that you would have as a manager. So let's just say for Jack, what experience we would have with Suzanne if she was actually a venturer versus a guardian? Uh, so very different. So I think everyone's had a chance to have a look. So from that profile, if you just want to type in um, into the chat, what's Suzanne's highest driver now, her strongest driver when we look at this venturer profile? Yep, Rhee's put in there both trying to dominate. Yep, both don't like the detail. Yes, the highest driver is that A, dominance drive. Um, so they're both going to definitely be on board with the, the change initiative because they're going to want to take it in their stride. They see it as a new opportunity. It's a new challenge. Um, remembering that people who have that higher dominance drive do want to be challenged. If they've got three months to implement something and see change, they're going to say, heck yes, let's do it. Let's show that we can um, adapt to that. Um, but good point also, uh, Re. yes, they both are not very in on the details. So they've got that lower formality drive. Um, so probably won't be as process driven as Suzanne. Now, do you think that that might be uh, 
an issue amongst the team if we had everyone who had that lower formality drive and in terms of having that um, expectations of the rules and structure and implementing it? Do you think it would be good to counterbalance that with someone that has that higher formality drive and making sure that we sort of observe that in the team? Re, you put yes. Yep. And if you want to elaborate a little bit more why you think yes, that would be great. But definitely, I think it would still be important if we had Suzanne now, who has that lower formality drive, still really important that we look at the rest of the team and we sort of pull on people who might be able to hold people accountable, hold everyone accountable to that process. Um, I know Shannon can probably comment a little bit more with her corporate hook, how she feels with that low patience, low formality and having to use a system like Trello or, you know, Mondays or whatnot. Yeah, so definitely um, patience isn't isn't very high for, for people like with this, with this kind of looking profile. The D um, up high, it just means you kind of, you just want to get things done quickly and fast and you don't want things like systems and process and procedures to slow you down from implementing um, what it is that you have to. So in this case, it's a big change. You want to just get it done. You don't, you don't want processes and red tape to slow you down. Um, so for sure that that would be an impact bit of a challenge yeah and I really like um what you've put in here Re. you've seen firsthand so definitely running a project if you've got people who aren't as in on the detail it can cause some issues later down on the track um and the process driven approach might not be there so really important again to identify who you have amongst your team if you have those higher formality people bring them in let them hold you accountable to make sure that the process is in place and that everyone is following it but if you have a team who potentially maybe you don't have those high formality people, it will be really important um, that you might have to flex that behaviour and put measures in place to hold each other accountable so that the process doesn't break down um, more in the long term. So again, great reason why we all have to be really knowledgeable of our own profiles and our team's profiles because that awareness piece can really help us. But to Rhiannon's um, point before, te good teams, great teams are made up of a mixture of people. So diverse thinking, diverse profiles, diversity of thought, that's where it all comes from. So if you're going to have a really effective, strong team that can deliver the best outcome or whatever it is that you're, you're looking for, it needs to be um, a mixture of everyone's profiles. And if you don't, like Alexia touched on, it's making sure that you're aware of your limitations so that you can make sure that those gaps are filled before you go and, um, you know, into the, into the change. Definitely that diverse thinking and those diverse opinions are really important. And that's where, you know, you might see for Jack now, if we, you know, if we were a captain, we might see Suzanne's profile when it was a guardian and think, oh, that might not suit me or might not suit my team. But really evaluate it from that perspective of where are the gaps um, and how can that person's strengths that might actually be your blind spot areas, how could you leverage those and vice versa? How can they leverage your strengths? So I think that's what's really um, important here for sure. Any other comments from anyone on how? Um, they think that Suzanne now would adapt to change or any questions to do with mm -hmm. the switch in the profile? Alicia's popped a question in here. Where would Suzanne as a venturer and Jack as a captain have conflict? Yes, yep, some are. great responses. That high yep. dominance, they both want it their way. Very independent thinking, right? Very great um, responses. Kathleen, yes, definitely. Might not like to be supervised closely, for sure. Won't want to be micromanaged. I love it speaking from experience. I love that everyone's bringing in their own profiles. Definitely that authority piece. You've got two really high independent people who like to be challenged, but also like to work independently. And there might be a bit of conflict there in terms of how do they 
go about um, implementing the best way for this change initiative to take place in the team. So Jack might have one opinion, Suzanne now as a venturer might have another opinion and they might actually disagree. Um, and so that's another thing to take note of um, in terms of that authority factor. And definitely Suzanne won't want to be micromanaged as a high, with that high dominance drive. She will want that flexibility to take the lead on her own projects, her own initiatives and really go forward with it 100%. Also, just to counter that, though, Alexia, yes, they've got both got a strong independence um, aspects, but uh, Jack and Suzanne's B, their extroversion is is different, right? So if they were to get into a high conflict situation, Suzanne is still more of a reserved character than uh, Jack's. Um, uh, <laughs> high extroversion drive. Yeah, he had more of a high extroversion yeah. drive. So if they did have a really intense conflict, it's likely that Suzanne is still going to back down a little bit because she has more of that reserved nature versus Jack's profile. Yeah, definitely might have to think things through a little bit. Um, she might get into over spot. email, Shannon. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the lower the B, the more likely the conflict hits over email. So that's something to watch out for. Definitely, definitely. And that's a good, even a good question out to the team where everyone can have a little laugh at themselves if they've um, ever been in that situation where the conflict's actually gone over email rather than in person. But really good point, Alicia. Um, definitely. Um, yeah, might end up being a bit different. Bree said, yes, it's happened. So that's another thing to observe as well. Excellent, everyone. I really appreciate all your commentary. Yeah, Noel's also mentioned about the timeline. Suzanne really, you know, wants to get it done right. Jack, Jack wants it quick. So yep. that's another complimentary partnering. So that 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 being able to look at a profile and recognize where you can complimentary partner together with people is 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 the secret sauce, like Alicia said. Super helpful in in managing team dynamics. Mm. Yeah, so it's amazing sure. how all those people came to life and all we did is look at some dots on a page. Yes. Isn't it great? <laughs> Everyone's put their PI hats on and really looked at this and thought deeply, which is awesome. So really appreciate all your comments, everyone. Um, it's really great to make it a bit more so just what we think, but getting your opinions and perspectives on this as well. So just before finally we wrap up, I thought if there's any final questions that anyone had, I thought I'd just put a placeholder here to do with any of the profiles or anything that we've spoken about today, feel free to pop it um, in the chat. If you've got a question, I'll just give everyone 30 seconds or so just to make sure that there's nothing lingering, but definitely feel free if um, you have any questions that you think of later that you can email Shannon and I and we'll most definitely answer. I have a question for the group, if anyone's comfortable sort of just typing a yes or no in the chat box. Are any of you going through or approaching a change initiative at the moment? I know change is constant and it happens every day in different situations, but I'm talking like a, a bigger change that's going to affect a significant, you know, proportion of your workforce. Sorry, the question was just more around if, um, is your organisation facing a uh, change that's coming up? Do you have a big change that is on the horizon yeah. that you're in the middle of? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, we are. Um, it's Tolly speaking, by the way. Um, we're, we had acquired another company uh, mm. last year and the... Um, Combining of the two businesses into a single entity is occurring um, later this year. Yeah. So right now we're still, for the most part, operating relatively independently, and the kind of it's just for the most part situation normal since the acquisition. But that will then um, start to come together and crystallise into a single organisation with common tools and everything like that. And I think there will be, you know, a clash of of cultures as yes. they come together and individuals and suddenly the things that used to separate us, such as, you know, not having a chat tool between us or anything like that or common filing systems or whatever else, they'll all be gone. Everything will be much more um, uh, apparent. And yep. so I think that will be significant change. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there's, yeah, and um, the, and 
yeah, that, that, that I think will be a big one. Yeah. No, thank you so much for mentioning that. Outside of a pandemic, um, the managing a acquisition is one of the biggest changes you can um, manage in the change management program world. So that's um, going to be, you'll definitely should be uh, integrating some knowledge with the use of PI as your data point to sort of try and help you manage that change because people managing people through change is is tricky especially in an acquisition yep. yeah definitely leveraging yeah, those profiles yeah yep yeah it will be it will be quite interesting i think that they're yeah. they're, they're very as terms of the organizations themselves they're both in their own right quite successful and good at what they do they do very different things so i think there's a lot of complementary aspects to the acquisition and merge, but there are going to be significant differences between the way the two things have viewed outcomes and approached problems and how they view success and things like that. Because yeah, they're, they're just they're kind of they're just different. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, we need to find a way to to make that um, to get through that in a in a constructive way. Yes. Absolutely. Definitely bringing that awareness piece that you can utilise PI and really evaluating people's profiles and seeing who will be um, those change implementers or get on board with those change and who might you get a little bit of resistance from and just tailoring the approach um, with each, each team and in each individual might be a little bit different, um, but really get in on the tool and evaluate people's profiles. That's probably the, the best way that you can leverage and make sure that you're um, adjusting the style or other managers are adjusting their style to get everyone on board and, and working towards the same direction. Perfect. Thanks so much, um, Dolly, for sharing that with us all. Um, finally, guys, we've just got a little mentee. Um, if you want to head to www.mentee.com, we'd love to just get a little bit of your feedback. There's just two really quick questions there um, just to gauge your thoughts after this first session that Shannon and I um, have been running. So if you head to www.menti.com. Um, it will just ask you to pop in a code, which is here on the screen in red, 91631989. There'll just be two questions there if you don't mind briefly answering um, and giving us a little bit your feedback. Like I said, we'll be continuing the next one next Wednesday, same time at 2 p.m. And we'll be talking about feedback, which I think will be a great topic because feedback is just part of every manager's process with every team member. Um, so it'd be really useful just to get any thoughts or ideas before we um, get into that one next week. But thank you all for participating. I really appreciate it um, from all of us at the team here at Red Wolf. And it was great to get your thoughts on this topic in terms of driving change. So thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon and we hope to see you next week.